Let's start by talking about the relationship between the RPO and the City of London Choir. And here we are in the Cadogan Hall with uh, concerts to look forward to. What have audience members got to look forward to in terms of that relationship? Well, we've had a, a, a really quite continuing relationship uh, over, the, over the last decade, and it's been enormously fruitful, I think. Uh, apart from anything else, of course, all performance you know, is, is, a, is about people getting on with each other and they have to do a job, they don't have time for lots of cosy chats, but the truth is if they know each other and they like each other, it's going to be better. It's as simple as that, of course. So a strange group of musicians, however skilled, are going to be just a little bit trickier than people who know you, know the conductor, and, and the whole thing it has a sort of family feeling. And it's easy to overstate this, you know, I can do sort of Bernsteinian sort of, oh, it's not so much love. Uh, uh, I, I'm not sure so much love is exactly it, but there is something in that that actually if you get on with people and you like what you're doing with them, you are very likely to produce a better result than if you don't. And when you look ahead to those forthcoming concerts, what do you pick out in terms of some of the performances? Well, we're in the middle of this series of late Haydn masses, uh, and I could uh, uh, bore your viewers to death with those. I mean, they are, in my view, six of the greatest things ever put down by a European composer. They were very near the end of his life. For the first time, he was completely financially secure. He no longer had anything to prove at all because he was an enormous international celebrity. And he just l sort of relaxed into these pieces and wrote fantastic masterpieces. No attempt to show up. It's very interesting to compare late Haydn with late Mozart because late Mozart was not in the same place. He was soured and disappointed. And his music has a sort of quality. It's wonderful music, but I don't mean it's silly. But you know, the, the Jupiter Symphony is all about sort of aren't I clever? I'm going to prove to you, you've got this wrong, you know, I'm the, I'm the best there is, do you realize? Uh, and Haydn isn't doing that at all. He's just saying these, this text, you know, he, was, he was a committed Christian, so for him the text you know, had certain resonances beyond what it had to those who were not. And he used every ounce of skill he'd acquired over 40 years to make the music live. And I think they're absolutely extraordinary. And interesting, the choirs, I mean, this choir is unusual because the average age has gone down every year for the last 15 years, and it's currently 29. Now, we all know that, sadly, the English choral tradition is, is aging. I mean, Gareth Malone has done something to make it more attractive to younger people, but it's still true that has not really translated into lots of younger people joining choirs. And there are many reasons. It's not just that they don't find singing all that attractive. Some people do. But pressure on young people at work is so great. Now, we have people who come to the choir at half past six, and at quarter to nine when we finish, they go back to work. Now, I think that's ghastly, and I wish it didn't happen, but it does. But that average age point is interesting. I mean, where are you finding these young choristers of, of such high levels of skill where others perhaps aren't finding them? Well, it's an extremely interesting question, and uh, I only have sort of half the answer, I think, to that. Uh, we um, had a chairman in the 90s. I've been conducting the choir for 25 years. And in the middle 90s, one of my ex-students from St. Paul's Girls School, who was a consultant anaesthetist, but a very young one, took over. Uh, did all sorts of good things for the choir, actually. But above all, she brought in some of her friends who brought in some of their friends, and they brought in some of their friends, some of whom are slightly younger than they were. And it's a sort of rolling program. Once you crack it, the thing is, if your average age is sort of in the upper 50s, someone in their 30s or three or four people in their 30s will find it rather off-putting. It's not an ageist thing, really. Who might have talked about ageism? But the truth is that you want to have some people around you you feel sympathetic with, just as we were saying a few moments ago. And I think the point about that is once you have a certain number, you have a critical mass, it begins to push itself along. And we have very good contacts uh, with Oxford and Cambridge. There are people coming down who have been ex-choral scholars, who aren't professional singers, but are good amateur singers, um, do know about the choir, and quite a lot of them come to join us. And we have a special relationship with Mark Williams, who's the director of music at Jesus Cambridge. He's our associate conductor. So obviously he's very helpful in directing young singers from Cambridge towards us. But it's a competitive world, isn't it? I mean, for a choir to remain with as uh, good a reputation as yours for as long as it has, this idea of longevity and stability, it's, it's very hard to maintain that. Isn't it? You're absolutely right, completely right. And you know, you're only as good as your last show. That applies to all professional musicians, doesn't it, actually? But it's particularly true for a choir. If you have a bad season, people have plenty of other places to go. And I think some of them will. So you've got to make sure that every season is exciting. And, and to come back to the Haydn, I mean, that was one thing that was interesting. I mean, I, I wouldn't have thought if you'd woken up members of this choir and stuck electrodes on their noses and said, what's your number one piece to sing, that they'd have said the harmony mass of Haydn. But the great thing is that now they've actually sung some of these masses and they're getting into the cycle, they do get it. You know, I mean, now the great thing is I don't have to sell these pieces anymore. They've got it. And the audience? 
Uh, well, the audience is, you know, I, I, obviously I'm less in touch with the audience, uh, but the audience have been extremely full for both the first two, and I think we have every reason to hope the next one will be as well.